Well, hello and welcome to the New Schools Podcast. Montessori. It's perhaps the most widely recognized method or brand in alternative education, particularly for preschool ages. And it would be hard to find someone more steeped in the world of Montessori than today's guest, Jesse McCarthy. Jesse has worked in education for over 15 years and got his start at a small Montessori school in California. And now he's worked with thousands of children, teachers, and parents as an elementary and junior high school teacher, a head of school for infants to eighth graders, an executive with a nationwide group of Montessori schools, and a parent and teacher mentor through the organization which he founded and you can find at MontessoriEducation.com. Jesse received a bachelor's in psychology from UCLA and his Montessori teacher's diploma for three to six-year-olds from the Association Montessori Internationale, an organization founded by Dr. Maria Montessori. He's also the host of the Montessori Education Podcast, This show gets into the nitty gritty of Montessori and what makes it so popular. You'll learn how it differs from other methods, for example, in its approach to reading, about the innovations and evolution of Montessori over time, and Jesse's advice to parents wondering if Montessori is right for their family. And now here's your host, also a founder of a Montessori preschool, Shannon Falkenstein, speaking with Jesse McCarthy. Hello, Jesse McCarthy, and welcome to the New Schools Podcast. We're so happy to be talking with you today. Happy to be here, Shannon. Cool to talk with you. Great. So, um, so as we were just talking, uh, there is a a woman who is a, an Acton founder named Ann Olderog, and. She um, wrote a wonderful article when the pandemic started, and it essentially was saying that it was comparing COVID in education to what happened after the Black Plague. And she, her um, wonderful um, prediction is that it will follow the same thing that happened in history, is that after the plague, came a great renaissance. And so her very positive theory is that the same impact will be had in education. And so that after COVID, because there'll be such a time of breaking habits, breaking old conventions, having to find new ways of doing things, that that will usher in a renaissance in education. And that that renaissance will be very much a Montessori model. And I know that you're a very strong Montessorian Um, So I wanted to meet with you today and talk to you kind of about that. Like, how does Montessori fit into all that? And like, get into everything with you about Montessori. But our, um, but that's our premise. So just right off the bat, like, what do you think of that? I mean, that's fascinating. On the historical front of that, that's interesting because, I mean, the Black Plague just decimated, you know, all the population, not especially the elderly. So there's something something about that I'm a little bit concerned about all a lot of the elderly being gone because I think a lot of today children aren't exposed to as much of that wisdom that's brought down with living a full life um, and you know, obviously it comes with some traditionalism in some people but often when I speak with you know the older generation I look for the the gems that they have that you know myself and maybe you and, and others don't have because we just haven't had that life so I think it's a sad situation in my view, because we're losing that um, or losing a lot of that. But I, I think she's hundred percent right. Um, And the, the biggest perspective for me on that is that parents are actually seeing, like they literally are sitting in on these zoom class and seeing what the teaching is really like in traditional school. And where before, you know, parents just, there's just a normal acceptance. Oh, I, give my child to the school and he'll be, he'll be all right. Or she'll be all right. And now they are actually seeing what it looks like. And they're like, you know, some of them are horrified, you know? 
so even I think there's a potential that even though it's the virtual that they're a little horrified about, they might start questioning a little bit more deeply the actual school if they're, you know, even without virtual in-person school, is it any good that they're sending their kids to? So I think it's it's right. And Montessori, you know, obviously I think Montessori is the answer, particularly for the young. But yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, what Let's do jump into Montessori. So um, first of all, you know, I know people try to, I hear a lot of times we have schools that will say like, we're Montessori, Waldorf, Finland method, you know, or something where <laughs> they kind of like lump yeah, all yeah. these things together as though yeah. simply because they are unconventional alternatives, they must all be the same. So could you yeah. kind of debunk that a little bit or d- just, um, you know, do the reveal on that for us? What are the key yeah. differences between these methodologies? And let me say as a preface, I don't think there's any way to talk about this stuff without offending somebody. So, you know, because oftentimes these topics are talked about people like, oh, well, I respect all places and all methods and so forth. And in some respects, I think like these approaches that you're talking about, like Waldorf, in some ways they're better than traditional school because the child has a lot more freedom. So I think a lot of times they're lumped or as you said, lumped together because it's the freedom of the child or it's focused on the child as opposed to, I've got this stuff I want to ram down, uh, you know, the young's minds. Uh, but I think there's definitely fundamentally different. Um, and when the differences really start to show is that Waldorf, like, well, uh, as an example, Waldorf doesn't think that you should teach the very young to read. So they wait till about seven years old. Whereas in Montessori, we don't think of these, you know, like reading as this old school academic, we're going to teach children to read, but children love to read when it's done well, mm-hmm. you know? And as a parent yourself, and as any parent can see, when you have little babies, when they're grown up, they love to see you read and they love you to read with them. So it, there's actually something really amazing about preparing a child so that they can read on their own at a very young age. I'm talking four years old, maybe potentially even earlier. So, at, you know, normally it's about five or six, but at four it can happen. So I think it's important to look within these different methods and say, well, what do I think is actually true versus, you know, we want to have empathy for everybody and say, hey, it's, you know, it's an interesting approach. If it's, if you like it, go for it. But there are very significant differences and they can have an impact on your child's life and yours as a parent or a teacher. So. And tell us more. So for example, my, one of my children learned to read very young, like three and a half, four, you know, very young. And then another one, she was like, not really into it, mom. And she learned more at closer to seven. Yep. And um, is it, what I understand from Montessori is that Maria Montessori observed children scientifically. And she mm-hmm. found through rigorous scientific observation of children that there were actually these sensitive periods and that there were two in reading and that one comes kind of at that earlier age and then another one comes kind of at a later age, right? Like more like six or seven. Um, And that those were not that you can't learn to read in other periods, but those are the time where the brain is really wanting to read and really set up for that. Is that true? Yeah. So, I I mean, I like, actually, I really like your focus on showing that the observation became, came before the theory. So often in education, you know, you go, oh, I've got these grand ideas. This is what the world should look like. And now let me put it on others. Where Maria Montessori, as you said, she was a scientist. She observed children and said, what's in their nature? What are they like? So with the reading, what's fascinating about it, she observed ch- that children, they couldn't reach the stage of reading in, in as quickly as they could actually write. Because Montessori was able to use these, you know, not like a pencil and paper writing, but was able to use these trace, you know, these sandpaper letters and then have this movable alphabet where they can move the letters around. So she was able to see that children can form the letters and words. And then as they were forming them, they said, well, they can read what they've written. So there was this natural progression into reading. And this allowed them to read their own writing in a way, which was really fantastic um, because the reading came with phonics. So mm-hmm. in the language that ha- is phonetic language, you can sound out each letter and then you can connect the letters. And then if there's a word in front of you, cat, cat, you can read it because you know each individual sound. So she saw that children could do this and then do it very early. And it was, it was you know, she calls it like explosion into reading or explosion into writing. 
Um, and children just read at a much earlier age than, than people thought possible or, or average thought possible before. Uh, so it did come from observation. And she said, well, this is the way in which we can bring this about in, you know, most children. You know, as I say most children because some children, yeah, they don't, they don't, and really it's not their inability to do it like, you know, mentally, but they might not have the, the motivation for it at, at four or five, but at seven, something just piques their interest. And it's like, again, they are just like, like there, you know? So, um, so yeah, but she definitely saw it through observation first and then created, you know, built up theories based on the observation. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people think that self-directed education, I feel like in, in my case, right, in Acton's case, mm -hmm. the idea of self-directed education really came out of the love for Montessori and the understanding of Montessori, but wanting to continue that for the older grades and for, for the older children. And tell me, from what I understand from Maria Montessori is that she focused mostly on three to six-year-olds and then later sort of developed one to three year old, you know, um, materials third, yeah. and things. But then for kind of older than six, or, or you tell me, but it's like at some point there, it's like the Montessori thing ends and there's nothing directly from her. Some people yeah. have inferred and observed and developed more Montessori curriculum. But, but my point is that Parents may choose in the beginning, like, I really want my child to be in Montessori, but then they mm -hmm. come up at about six years old and it's like, there's no option to continue with that. So they're kind of forced yeah. to put their child in conventional school. That was certainly my case. Yeah. And, and then it's like, well, what do we do? I don't want to change them from wonderful Montessori into sitting yeah. in a desk, listening to a teacher talk. What do you like, what do you tell parents? What can they do in their, if they're in a situation like that? Yeah. I mean, and that's one of the reasons I have a lot of respect for Acton and Jeff Sandifer and what he did, because he saw that there was a there was a gap or there was a hole in this field or in this market and saying, how can we fill this and actually offer children and parents something valuable? So I, I think it's amazing. The issue with Montessori is you're right that her, her main focus, particularly in the beginning, was the young, the very young. So the, the most developed by Montessori herself is obviously a three to six. And then it goes down, as you were saying, with some of the infants, with some of her followers started to create more in-depth, you know, elements in the infant program, infant and toddler. Um, and then there is the, the, you know, the six to nine and then the nine to 12 in terms of the ages, there is a lot of Montessori material and work developed and there's full programs that are developed. The problem is not, I think, with the development, um, although there, there's all sorts of things that can be added in, you know, developed as that it's more of that the implementation so as you said like maybe you were a parent and you had this Montessori school and then poof at six years old it's like now go off to normal school and I think it's because either those schools did not choose to go up because it's harder it's harder to convince parents to spend money on something where they're getting some free education on the side you know mm -hmm. um, so there's a there's a market thing that's harder but there's also, it's, it's more challenging to run those classrooms because it's not, as, it's not as well developed and implemented more broadly as the younger years. So either you're gonna get cities where there is no Montessori elementary and junior high, or you potentially get cities where there's one really good one and the rest are just, you know, mm -hmm. who knows what they are. So I think that's the real challenge, not necessarily that you can't do it well. It's just that a lot of, programs have not succeeded um, or they just never attempted to put them on. So, you know, people like yourself are like, what am I going to do? And you've got this acting program, you put it together. So. Okay. So you would say like either kind of start something yourself, try to find a Montessori program that, that is in your town that does a great job for the older years or kind of how could you, if you're really dedicated to following the child and trusting the child, yet you only have a conventional system, what would you say to parents that they could do to kind of augment that? I mean, I think, you know, just as you know, you're in Acton and, and I don't know how all the schools are kind of, you know, if there's some, if Jeff is up there going, this school is good, this one's no good. You know, I know that's not what's happening, but you know, there's uh, with a lot of schools when they become these systems and these philosophies, people apply them differently. So when I talk to parents, even in Montessori, whether you're going to act in Montessori, whatever you're doing, 
you really have to be an independent judger. Just like Montessori herself was kind of like a scientist. You go in and observe and say, does this look like it's child led with a, with a real guide who has knowledge and authority, but does it look like it's child led? So you need, to, you need to really delve into that, whatever the program is. So if, you, if there is no Montessori near you and you don't want to you know, create a school, then go to some of these alternative programs and just get a sense of how, how much are they towards the child led? How much, if you sit down with the, the actual teacher, just have a normal conversation. Does she respect children? Mm-hmm. Does, he, does he think that children's emotions are important or do you just shut them down? You know, like, does he think testing in grades and getting to the best college is the way to success? Or is he like, you know what, if you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be this, it's really important, but there's some fields. I mean, I have friends that are millionaires that they, they dropped out of college. So, you know, that you, is the person kind of radical in the sense that it's your life, what you want to do with it? Or is it the traditional in this, this is the exact way you're supposed to rise. Right. The factor. You know, that's, that's the advice I would give. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The fact, you know, yeah. So be an, be an independent thinker, be an observer, get in there, interview mm-hmm. question, you know, really like uncover it so that you can know exactly what you're getting into instead of just kind of giving up. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And it's Shannon, it's like, you know, I've heard a lot these days about, I heard some guy said the craziest comment, like, well, this guy can't speak on it because he, he hasn't studied it. Like I have, I'm a scholar. And and I, I'm all about expertise. Like I go to experts to find and understand things, but we have to be, we really have to be independent in what we're doing. So I think you as a parent, Shannon, and any normal parent can look and talk with the teacher and sense, does this person respect and care about children? Do they have a view that your life is your own to live and you're going to make it happen? You don't have to go the exact route of others. Um, or do they not? You don't need me sitting next to you as the expert to say, you know, it sounds right. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, if you had three different Montessori schools in your community and you thought they were good and you needed some really expert guidance on which one is, you know, really, then I might be able to help. But I'm saying to the extent you can utilize your own judgment as an independent, you know, human being. Right. Seek your own counsel. Yep. I love it. Um, so a lot of people think that self-directed education or Montessori, they have a, um, a misconception that is very laissez-faire or that there are no boundaries and they think, well, if my child can choose what they're going to do, what if they just choose to do nothing all day or what, yeah, you know, yeah. they, there's a misconception. Could you speak a little bit to that? Yeah. And I think that's understandable given, given the state, I think modern, the modern Montessori movement, and I don't even know if we can call it a movement, it's just random groups and, and different organizations and so forth. There is a lot of emphasis, particularly online and social media on, the freedom, but there's rarely an emphasis on the structure. And, and Montessori was, I mean, this woman was hardcore with structure. So she didn't, she had this wonderful line. She's like, there are enough children in the classroom. You don't need to become one with them or something like that. Like Whoa. She, <laughs> yeah. So she, she can be tough. So yeah. with parents with that, I think, again, if, you know, parents, they care about the philosophy of Montessori, but they really care about what's the school in my neighborhood. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like there's, so when you're at that school looking at your Montessori school, are the children running around crazy, just literally doing whatever they want, like some very progressive schools are like? Mm-hmm. Or do you see children choosing activities, but they're not you know, crazy doing whatever they want all day long? So Montessori is very structured in the sense that these are the, these are the choices you can have. And within those choices, you're free. But outside of that, there's a real wall. And you cannot go past that. And and it might sound kind of dictatorial, but that wall gets bigger and bigger as the children grow up and get more freedom until it disappears and it's, and it's existence, it's life. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's very, it's, it's, an, it's an exciting thing, you know? It really is. Yes. So it's like freedom, but within limits. Yep. Uh-huh. I and mean, then- that's, the, that's, the, that's the tagline. And, the, and you can think of, you know, as an analogy, the limits are, if you had a toddler, you want to have a smaller space, you know, unless you're out there holding their hand and playing in the park or something yeah. like that, but, or else that toddler is going to run off and get into some really dangerous stuff. Right. So without the, without those walls, we all would be in trouble if we didn't have any limitations um, just in terms of even the house. If my house was like 20,000 square feet, I don't know, you, it might look cool from the outside, but that's not going to be as fun as a, as a house that really fits, um, you know, my family. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Right. Great point. 
Um, what do you, what would you say are there, and if so, what are they, kind of the most important evolution? You know, like m- m- Dr. Montessori created this over 100 years ago or something mm-hmm. like that. And she, she, but has there been an evolution or, um, or an improvement or innovation in Montessori since then? So her, the first school was opened in 1907. So we're talking over a hundred years for sure. Uh, but even in, the question's interesting, Chen, because I'm thinking when you say, has there been an improvement? We have to first start at, well, what's, what do we have? And then what, what would you want as an improvement? So I'm not suggesting I, it should improve. I just mean like, yeah. you know. Has, yeah, and I don't mean it like you're like, Jesse, where, is this thing improved? If it's a hundred. <laughs> years old it's, it's old ass <laughs> stuff man no but uh but i mean it as like i'm asking the question because i think there's a tendency to t- today and i think it's a healthy tendency to want to always improve like i want to always improve but improvement means that you know we're something wasn't going that well before we need to change it so i think it's what i found particularly in the tech community i'd say san francisco because i spent some time in san francisco helping with a few schools and what you've seen with the tech world is they think, well, traditional school's bad. So we're going to create our own little thing and we're going to improve traditional schooling. But they came in with just threw money at the problem. So they created these creator spaces, but they just skipped over some things that were actually like Montessori. They just said, well, you know, there's what I'm trying to get at is there's something that was well done and we haven't yet even utilized what's there. Uh-huh. So I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit skeptical of trying to quote, improve something that we haven't yet fully implemented. I mean, it's, I think it's like less than 1% of the schools in America. Is Mont- so, or Montessori school. Yeah, they're just, mm-hmm. they're just not, they're not a lot of them. So, um, so that's, that's kind of a long winded to say that I don't think, you know, we need to improve. However, there are definitely different things that occur in a classroom, depending on where your culture is, where your context is. If you're in the, if you're in a big city, you cannot have a big nature in the back. So you have to come up with creative ways to have children actually explore. Do you go on a walk to the park? You know, so there's, there's, I think there's improvements in that way in terms of adapting to your environment, but the foundational elements of Montessori about following a child, freedom within limits, mixed ages, these things have not improved quote, improved or changed since over a hundred years ago. Yeah. That, and I guess does that make sense? It, it does make sense. I mean, I think because children really haven't changed, right? Like, like the, 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 the nature of them, the right? human mm-hmm. is evolving on a different level than technology, obviously much slower. Mm-hmm. So well, humans are the same as when Maria Montessori was observing us and um, but the world has changed significantly. Like I imagine yeah. there are, now in a Montessori school, of course, there will be children older than six that are maybe using technology, yeah. but applying Montessori principles to the use of technology. Would you say that that's an accurate type of innovation? Yeah. And I think, you know, a good example of this is uh, coders. So, you know, we, I don't know, 15 years ago, coding would have been like, you would have been, a, you know, you're just making a lot of money, right? Where today... You know, code is like a dime a dozen. And I think the only way you're going to be successful is if you're doing something that one, ultimately you're passionate about, but two, you have a real foundation in, in understanding and taking care of yourself as an independent individual. Mm -hmm. So people say, well, don't you teach coding? And and it's not that hard to learn that skill. What's harder to learn is to have a foundation that I can actually take care of myself. So foundational skills, which in Montessori is a lot of practical life, like at the younger years, you know, you're washing, you're washing your own dishes in the classroom. You're, you're, you're making your own snacks in the classroom. Mm-hmm. Um, you're learning how to interact with people without the teacher always in your business going, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. Those skills at a basic level are so much harder to gain if you miss them later in life. You know, I mean, we, yes. we all know that as adults, as young adults, we've all had our difficulties, you know, growing up because most of us had crappy education. So with Montessori, the idea is to spend a lot more time on the foundational elements. And then, as you said, there's no doubt computers in elementary classrooms and they're doing these type of things. Like there's, there's classrooms that are teaching coding. But what I'm saying is it's not as important at the younger years as people might generally believe to be. Um, and I think that even a lot of coders and tech people would say this. Uh, 
you know, notoriously, yeah. a lot of tech people say we don't give our kids cell phones and social media. You right. Know, so. Yeah, so smart. <laughs> so um, w- talk about a little bit about that, about there's this, there's a concept that people talk about, like the Montessori mafia, like that the founders of Google went to Montessori, um, maybe Jeff Bezos. You know, there's a lot of rumors. I'm yeah, not exactly yeah. sure who they say went no, to did. Montessori yeah. or if they did. <laughs> but um, <laughs> do, you, do you think that's just, you know, random coincidence? Or do you really think there's something to Montessori that helps make people more creative, more curious, more independent, more, you know, groundbreaking yeah. or something? Talk about that a little. Yeah, so first let me say that since, you know, I, I run the site MontessoriEducation.com. Uh-huh. So when I first started creating content, I was like, oh, I'm going to utilize all these famous people and stuff. And of course, I've got burned enough where I know to do my research. Like, I'm not just going to copy paste, you know? <laughs> um, and, and I mean, in terms of being stupid and doing things that were like, I didn't realize you have to do this deep research. Um, so I would go to, you know, school sites and I'd, realize, and I'd look it up and realize like, even the founder of Wikipedia, um, Jimmy Wales, he had he had written a Wikipedia entry saying, "Listen, I know people are saying I go to Mon- I went to Montessori, but I did not. Now I put my kids in Montessori, but I did not." So and and Shannon, I'll, you, I'm telling you, if you Google you know Montessori famous people, you're going to find Jimmy Wales still on site. So I feel like there are. Pro- I feel like I'm going to run into a Montessori site someday, and it's going to say that Jesus went to Montessori. So, you know, like it's just. I, I really feel like it's going to happen. But all kidding aside, the thing that I think is very important with the children that went to Montessori school that are these famous ones you're talking about, um, Jeff Bezos did go to Montessori school. So it's, it's a fact. His mom said something about him and he, he talked about himself. I think he did an interview with um, AMS, which is the Association of Montessori, um, American Montessori Society, I almost mixed it up. Uh, so he is definitely a Montessori child and he's building schools. He just, he, he, he's investing a billion dollars in Montessori inspired schools. So it's, it's interesting that the people that went there find it important. And then like the Google founders, they don't, they didn't just go both of them by chance. They're not brothers or something. Uh, it's not just that they went to Montessori school. They literally say that it had a huge impact on their lives. So it's one thing if, you know, some of us went to traditional school and we've become pretty successful, but we're not running around going, oh, it's because of those 12 years in traditional <laughs> school that, you know. So uh, I'm not the type of person who thinks you can just cherry pick people and say, oh, look, because there are people, again, from traditional school that are very successful, whether spiritually, emotionally, um, financially, but are they saying that it's be- partly because of the education they had and can you really tie it back and i think with montessori um people like anne frank uh gabrielle garcia marquez you you're just looking at all-star individuals and 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 often they say this was a part of my development as a child so i don't know if that answers it completely but that's you know where what i would say okay no yeah i do i think that gives us a good answer thank you so let's change a little bit and talk about um, your Montessori discipline course. Would you tell mm-hmm. us more about that? That is actually focused on parenting, right? Yeah, no, interestingly, even with that, there are massive differences between being a parent and a teacher, but at, at root, we're all dealing with children. Like, as you said about, you know, they don't change. They haven't changed in a hundred years. So I think I made the course for parents, I think they were the ones that are like, I mean, all teachers are on edge at times, particularly in the early days of teaching, but parents and especially, and especially now given COVID and everything, they're just on edge. It's, it's crazy in the house. They haven't been trained and seen thousands of children and so forth. It's just theirs and maybe their neighbors and family. So I just thought, get something out there with some of the the former work I've done and, and create something new that would help them to really one, understand their child in comparison in in the sense of is this normal behavior you know Mm. with other children and then just give a a few foundational tips and and more mindset guidance on what do i do when my child won't pick up the toys what what do i do what i do when my child just yells at me and says no the young ones um an older one what do i do if he doesn't do his homework uh now in montessori there isn't homework but in again the big percentage of the world 
kids have homework. So, you know, what's that all about? So that type of thing uh, I put together. And tell us more about it. Like what, how can, is it, it's for parents of what age range? It's an online program. Yeah, it's an online program. Mm -hmm. You can go to MontessoriEducation.com and you can see there's a thing for, it says Montessori Discipline. Um, I would say it's primarily for, I'd say about toddlers. So two years and it can go all the way up. I mean, I focused on two to about 13 because that's, that's what my specialty is. And that's what I've spent a lot of time with. Um, but you, it really could be any, anything, but I would say two to 13, two to 12, two to 13 is really the range um, I would focus on. And, and the point is like, let's even say we've got Acton students that are in the classroom. It's not like they go home and they're like, these great learners with their parents all day long and, and there's no problems. Mm-hmm. So my approach is kind of parents at home, you know, you're going to have problems, It's not the end of the world, but if you want a little bit of guidance that can solve some of these things real, I mean, re- relatively easily, it's, it's worth, it's worth the shot. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. Excellent. And does, does the court, how long does the course last? Oh, sorry. So it's about, it's about three hours long. It's, it's short video segments. So they can range from about four minutes to, I think about 35 minutes or so. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you can go through it at your own pace. So, and then, you know, there's different sections in there. So if you think, you know, your big thing is that you need to observe your child more then there's some guidance on observation. If it's, you know, a yelling child, you're always getting an argument, then there's a section that's more focused on that, you know, that type of thing. And what can, it, there'll be a preview on the site too. You can check that out. So. Okay. Okay, great. Um, that's fantastic. And does it, it, so it, it uses Montessori prim- principles, I assume. Yeah. So the foundation is in Montessori. And then there's another man named Heim Gnott. I don't know if you've heard of him. Um, he wrote the book Between Parent and Child. No, I'm uh, not familiar with him. The other book maybe you'd be familiar with is How to Talk to Kids So Kids Will Listen. Oh, and yeah. How to Listen. Yeah. That's so, a classic. <laughs> yeah. So the women who wrote that book, Heim Gannat was their mentor. Oh, um, cool. So it's kind of like Heim Gannat is the OG. Oh, okay. You know? So I like to go, I mean, I think those women are great, but I like to go straight to the source. And this man is, and he's got a little bit more edge than, you know, he's in the sixties and seventies. So it's a little bit more edge than today. So I, I like the edge. So yeah, not like, you know, hitting your kid's edge. He's, he's all no, about no, empathy, mm-hmm. but he is just, he, he speaks in a direct way and I, I just, I really appreciate it and gives a lot of examples to it, so. Oh, that's great. A- examples I find are so powerful. Oh, yeah. So your, your, um, the wording about your course says that you help parents achieve inevitable success. What does that mean? How is that defined <laughs> and what does it look like? <laughs> I like this. This is a true parent talking to me. I like it. <laughs> You're not some college student grilling me. This is like a parent like. <laughs> um, so, I mean, inevitable success in the course, interestingly enough, it's, it's, it's wild that you, you asked that, but one of the earliest things we go over is mindset, mm-hmm. which, you know, can kind of translate into altitude. I mean, as a business person, I'm sure you've heard of altitude in the sense that you've got to get above the problems. So, you know, I go to, you're on the plane, you're looking down and nothing seems as big when you're looking down. And as a parent or as a teacher, when you're in the situation, when I'm in it with this child in front of me and he's like, I'm not doing you know, it's very hard to rise above. Not to right? get triggered. Yeah. So, but if you back up and I'm not talking in the moment, in the moment, sometimes we'll do wrong things. We've got to adapt and we'll figure it out later. But if before and during all these times you take a, let's say you go to Starbucks, wherever your local coffee shop is, and you take a seat and say, what do I actually want to accomplish? Like, what does success look like to me? Does success look like I'll never get in a fight with my child? Because if, if that's what success looks like, then you're, you're bound to fail. Right, give up. And that's like, <laughs> yeah, that's like now. success is I'll never get in a fight with my wife, ever. <laughs> like, is that, is that ever? I mean, what human being do we know that you never get? But anyhow, so when I say inevit- inevitable success, you're going to look at what do I want? And then there are steps to achieve that. But I don't mean the inevitable success of a parent so stressed out thinking, I need to stop this and my child needs to be perfect. There needs to be nothing on the floor ever. Everything needs to be clean. You know, I'm a star all all day long. I don't even have to sleep. They're going to fail. Right. But if you go through that process of really, you know, asking yourself, what do I want in the moment? What do I want long range? And then I give off a lot of steps on how to achieve that. I think it's inevitable. You got to put in the work like anything, but it's inevitable. 
It's inevitable. Okay. So it's like a growth mindset, kind of a mindset. Like it's not going to be, you're not perfect. It's not going to be perfect, but you can have incremental improvement over time by following these principles and and continuing to try and fail and try and fail and try. And then eventually you're going to like go up that learning curve. Yep. And I, you know, Montessori has this great quote, progress is not linear. Mm-hmm. And I think that, and just as you said right there, it's the fail, it's, you know, get back up. And it, funny enough, Montessori, that's what the whole philosophy is about is like, as a child, we fall down, we get back up, we fall down, we get back up. And I think, as I know, you're fully aware, traditional school, and often traditional parenting, it beats that out of you. So if you fail, you get an F and you are a failure. And I know there's a lot of people out there who go, well, well, that's life and we got to teach them. Talk to any successful business person today, particularly in tech communities and, and people that are very thoughtful. It's like, you have to fail fast, but you're going to fail and then get back up. But they don't say you don't fail and you shouldn't be, you know, they're almost like, when I, when I fail, it's awesome because I know I'm going to learn something. Yeah. You know, so I, so it's just, a, it, as you said, it's, it's a growth mindset. And I think it's, it, it goes even deeper because the growth mindset is kind of this, like, well, just feel there's a way in which it's like, feel you can succeed and don't worry about it. And, and this thing I'm saying, you know, just, you know, you're going to fail, be comfortable with it and get back up. Mm-hmm. So I think it, it is definitely a growth mindset, but Montessori, she kind of created a real system to achieve it as opposed to just whispering in your ear at night, you can do it. <laughs> like right. that, you know you know when you're feeling really crappy that's not that's not going to do it no that you can does do not it, doesn't do it. it right it does. <laughs> it does not it is, you need more than that i love that progress yeah. is not linear i think yeah, everyone needs to hear that every day she is the bomb with that quick little witty one i mean yeah. it's so good yeah she's so amazing so um you mentioned american montessori society and yeah. you almost mentioned Association, Association of Montessori <laughs> Internationale or whatever. So let's talk about that. AMS, <laughs> AMS and AMI, AMI, AMS. What, t- talk yeah. to us about the different certifying approaches. And then there are also, I always think of those as kind of the A-listers. And then there's like, there are mm-hmm. some other, you know, there are some other Montessori programs um, mm-hmm. just full confession, like I'm almost finished with my upper elementary certification and I chose to do North American Montessori center because it's distance mm-hmm. and I'm in yep. El Salvador and yep. I can't take, you know, a year or two to go and get it when an AMI program. So I chose mm-hmm. to do that. Um, so would you just talk a little bit about that? And it's fine if you critique the B levels, I don't mind, um, but we, I'm, I'm tough, but, uh, go, but just like, tell us a little bit about the different um, philosophies of those certifying bodies. Okay. I feel now when you say that you go ahead and critique them. I've got this black background, it's dark out here. I feel like I'm the <laughs> devil, like these bad people, you know, but no, I'm, you know, I'm the type of guy that I'm all about. I've seen people that were, you know, trained, you know, in a really rough areas and, and don't even have proper training. And these are, I mean, this is, these are the seniors I'm talking about. These are the old school people. And I take them any day over a lot of people I've seen trained at, even at AMI, which is supposedly the top. And it's, you know, started with Maria Montessori started AMI. So that's where I was trained. I think um, they do a wonderful job. I shouldn't even say they do a wonderful job. I should say my trainer did a wonderful job, Sylvia Dubavoy. Um, and I say that now because, and, and I'm not going to be your norm, Shannon. So like, I, I am, I'm so skeptical of big organizations now that, that their leader is no longer there. And, um, and not that they can't do a lot of good and they can be amazing, but I just, when you, when you talk with normal human beings, you get a sense of who they are. If somebody came up to me and said, oh, I'm a Christian, that could mean a million different things. Yeah. If somebody came up and said, I'm a Republican, it can mean a million different things. So I, I'm very hesitant to judge any of these as groups. So having said that, AMI was started by Maria Montessori. So it's, it's literally the organization she founded. Um, they are known even among people in AMS and even whatever organization you're in, they're known as the people that are the most stringent and they really stick to, you have to do the training. You have to do real training. You can't, this can't be softball stuff. You have to know what you're doing. You have to be in the classroom with children. You have to, I mean, Shannon, in, in the training, I spent hours upon hours 
over materials, acting as a child and then acting as the guy. And it was, it's hard work. Yeah. And no, no other training is like that from, from my, from what I've seen. Does that mean it's the best? You're, you know, it'd be up to different people to, to figure it out. Some people would say it's the best. Some people say it's the worst, what have you. Um, One critique so, I've yeah. heard of Amy is um, that I've heard people say that it's very rigid to the point mm -hmm. where it doesn't allow any kind of flexibility or invention. Um, mm -hmm. And that some, I've heard some people say, if Maria Montessori were alive today, she would, she would allow more, um, you know, more invention of new materials or of new ways of doing things. And mm -hmm. so I don't know, but what do you think of that having this much more experience than I do? First, I would say this. I, when somebody says, you know, if Maria Montessori were alive, I don't use that language. And I, I have a lot of people that I really admire, like um, Ayn Rand is a woman I admire. Frederick Douglass is a person I admire. But when people say, if Ayn Rand were alive, she would do X. Or if Frederick Douglass were alive, he'd say, I, I, I think you gotta be very careful. And I, I mean, I know, I know Maria Montessori. Like I've studied, I mean, again, I run a website dedicated to a lot of her work. Um, so I, I wouldn't go and say that. Now, having said that, Maria Montessori was one of the most radically independent individuals in, in history, yeah. in my viewpoint. So the idea that she would come back and be like, wow, I love what's going on, <laughs> doesn't strike me as something I think would happen, but I, I don't know. Yeah. So again, my, my advice to people out there is, I know wonderful people in AMI, all the way up, all the way up to relatives of Maria Montessori, beautiful people, and then all the way, quote, down to somebody who's, who's trained in an assistant course. Mm -hmm. And then I've met and worked with AMS teachers that there was one AMS infant guide, and she's no longer with us, unfortunately, who died, um, a friend of mine. And she has been, she was my favorite infant teacher ever. And she was AMS. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think it's, I would never come out and say this organization is better than that one, because it's no longer Maria Montessori in her house teaching five people. Right. It's, you know, hundreds of people teaching thousands of people. And I don't know 5% of them, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, so I, I, so that, that, I don't know, hopefully that uh, gives you some sense, but. Um, no, that's very I fair. And that's very intellectually honest. Thank you. Yeah. And Shane, I would say on this one, one of my, popular videos on YouTube and it's a podcast episode is I think it's called how to be a Montessori teacher or how do I become a Montessori teacher and I talk about this very thing in terms of uh, organizations and what to do it and I think it'd be good for parents to listen to too because it gives a sense of um, the organizations and then just what it takes to become a great Montessori teacher um, at least this is on your mind. website on Montessori education. yeah it's on my website and, and it's on the, it's a podcast episode yeah podcast. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We will link to that in the show notes so that people can get it if they're curious about learning cool. more about that. Thank you. So let me see what other questions that we have here for you. Um, you got a long list of questions, Shannon. I like it. I don't know. I think we're done. <laughs> okay. I was like, wow. They just keep coming, man. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, our, our episodes are usually about an hour and we're at like almost okay. an hour. So yeah, okay, um, cool. so I think I, I grilled you with the ones that I Yeah, and I, I think you know, somebody had said like, I, I, I glanced at some of the some questions that somebody sent me and I was like, oh, I'll just I'll just talk. But I think one of the things was like, oh, we won't trust us. We won't send any hardball questions or anything. And I'm like, these are all badass hardball questions. But I like it. I like it. Good. So I'm, I'm glad. So my my partner at school is a 20 year Montessori guide, and okay, she's taught me everything I know. And so um, oh, a lot cool. of this came from you know from being from being in it and doing it and that's just being cool. around it all day. Yeah, it's it is. I've learned so much from her, and just so much from this journey of working with a lot of children and um, Montessori. Like I said, Acton has its roots in Montessori, mm -hmm. but if I hadn't had my partner who's our director of Montessori with me, I never would yeah. have been able to fully understand Acton or children or any of this. So yeah. I really 
really grateful to her because I learn every single day of how to be better with children. And is she, is she a primary teacher? So look, again, like we live in El Salvador um, (laughs) and we don't have the same access here to education, to Montessori. You know, there's been one Montessori school here for decades and until we decided to open our own. Um, So my partner was learned under an AMI certified teacher Mm -hmm. for like 17 years and she was trained by her and she's wonderful and she knows she would hold her own with any AMI person I believe Um, Mm -hmm. but she hasn't been able to actually go and do her formal training with AMI or anyone else so um, she's one of those people that self-taught and not self-taught I mean she was taught by an AMI person but she doesn't have like the stamp of approval but um I don't know. I'd love for you to come down and observe us and tell us how. No, but Shannon, I mean, just what I got to tell you what you said, I'll give you an analogy. Like, would you rather have, like, say you're in the oil industry or something, would you rather have somebody who's like really been working there since a kid for 15 years? Or would you rather have a a guy who graduated from some intellectual oil, you know, school for two years? I I know who I'm taking, you know? So, and, and that's been my experience too. So I've seen all sorts of teachers that have been trained under masters or very strong people. And because they were kind of assistants or because they were, it was like an, a, an apprenticeship, kind yeah. of like some stuff that goes on in acting. They, they were just so much stronger than people that just get trained and have no experience. Yeah. You know? So I, no, no judgment at all here. I think you can make it happen in many different uh, ways. So. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And she is like, I mean, she's self-made and um, I think that there is a certain, um, oh, I lost my train of thought there. But um, actually, I think that that's very aligned with Acton also. And like one of the motivators for us to create Acton was that when my husband and I moved to El Salvador in 2008, right, mm-hmm. pregnant, um, and then 2000, we had a business, it was a call center that was selling financial information, kind of like Morningstar. Okay. But then because everyone got out of the stock market, we had to radically change and we basically lost that business. And we had been brewing beer in our home and because there was no good beer in El Salvador. <laughs> so we decided. Very Montessori. You were a Montessori child. Oh, right, I was a Montessori <laughs> child. And so was my husband. And so oh, we said, well, what the hell? Like, yeah. like, I don't know. I must've been crazy that day. Cause I told him, you know, I heard a story that when Vikings get to an island, like they would burn the ship so they could never leave and they would just had to make it happen. And I was like, we're here. We're just going to make it happen. Like, let's freak open a bottle of champagne and like toast our new life. Like, what are we going to do? And then we decided like, let's make a microbrewery because there was no microbrewery here. Uh So my husband learned how to brew online. Like he learned just by Uh reading. He's an auto autodidact. Like he, uh-huh, like I'm always saying that in Spanish, so I don't know if I'm saying it correctly. But what is it in Spanish? By the way? Autodidactico. Oh, autodidactico. Yeah. So he's okay. he's like uh-huh, a self-made learner, you know. And so he mm-hmm. had studied electrical engineering, and then had a business, and then he like learned how to brew by doing everything oh. um, just from interacting with other humans online and reading books and experimenting. And then we created this brewery, which now is actually the largest microbrewery in Central America, which isn't saying oh, much. It's man. a very small, it's a very no, small market. No, that's congrats. <laughs> but we that are that. Awesome. Thanks. And so from that, that whole experience, we, we realized like education is of course important and we both had great educations, but mm-hmm. it, what, what really was the most important thing was knowing how to learn. And yeah. you can learn, if you want to learn something, you can't be stopped. And so when yeah. we started acting with very little experience in doing that, we said like, we can do this because we know what we want and we know that we can learn it. And so we did. Yeah. And, that, and so I feel like my partner, Carmen, is that she's very much in line with that same thing. So, so here we wow, are. That's, <laughs> I'm so happy you told that story. That's fantastic. Thank I you. loved hearing that. that. I mean, I think that's, that's what we all ultimately want. I think as a parent, that's what you know, and as a teacher, as we want for the children, they grow up and they do their own microbrewery, whatever the equivalent is, you know? Right. Yeah. Because I don't know how many people would be able to 
break open a bottle of champagne and not just instead cry all night and then say I'm done and move back home or something like it's it's significant you know well that's Um, really kind of you to say thank you no but it's cool I like these these stories are meaningful to me so thank you yeah And how did you get into doing what you're doing? And you, you, of course, I think everyone probably assumes you have kids, but how did you decide to become a Montessorian? Yeah, I mean, I, I was basically in relatively traditional school. I think we did some unique stuff, but I had this opportunity to to basically teach an eighth grade vocab class. Mm -hmm. And it was, again, traditional school, but I'm you know, as much as it's traditional, I'm still having fun with kids. This is not like do your work. Right. <laughs> uh, but what I, what I found was that one, I love being around young kids. Like it was just such a blast being around teenagers again and just having that dialogue and having fun. But the second thing is, as I was trying to teach them vocabulary, I realized I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. So it was this wonderful journey of like learning right alongside the children or the students. So, you know, that's kind of become a tagline with Monster Education is like, we're going to learn right alongside our children or our students. And that was my initial thing. And I was like, I want this. I want to go back to school again. And I'm in school. I get to teach and I get to learn. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. I can't think of anything more better. And then over time, I realized, you know, why is a 13 year old raising his hand to go to the bathroom? Yes. Something's real. Something weird is going on. But the only way I could discover that is there was a Montessori class down the hall, and children were using the bathroom on their own without telling the teacher, "Hey, I'm going to go." To, you know, and they were four. So, <laughs> and exactly. Mm-hmm. So it, it that was the slow development to to getting past my own sense of like, oh, I know, I know what I'm doing, and being like, no, you don't know what you're doing, bud. And they know a lot more. Those those female teachers because they're females and most of the upper school teachers were males you know how this is normally in education Mm -hmm. and I said these female teachers working with babies that's the way I used to think of them they're the babies they know more about children than I do and it was you know it was one of those truly humbling experiences I could be proud of that moment and say I you know I I rose up and said I don't know much but it was humbling in the sense that yeah I really don't know much you know so that was my transition okay so then you decided to 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 dedicate your career to Montessori? Well, I, I should say my career is dedicated to, I, I love being around people that are enjoying their lives. Like it sounds like you're having a pretty good time. You're drinking beer, you know, with your <laughs> husband and so forth for a living. Uh, so I want to see more like that. And I want to be around more like that. So I think the fundamental way to do that is to work with children or with ourselves and to reconnect with who we were as children. Mm-hmm. Um, so Montessori, I think, is the fundamental of that, but I don't think it's everything. Yeah. So I, I, you know, promote Montessori because I think it's the foundation, but it, you know, I take all sorts of things from different areas and utilize it. To how can we be our best people and how can we work with children best? So, so yeah. Wonderful. Yes. I, yeah. I love working. The number one thing I love about working with children is I, they just want to have a great time. They want yeah, to be learning. Right? They want to be exploring. They want to have, they just, they want to have fun. They want to laugh. And yes. then we lose that as adults and become so like afraid and, you know, yeah. insecure and striving and distracted and it doesn't feel good. And then when you're yeah, around no. kids and get lost in the moment with them and you come out of that and you're like, wow, that was like actually fun yeah. and I felt great and my my worries disappeared and I was like in the in the moment in the flow you know and that's that's what when you work with kids you get that energy all day long which is yeah. so renewing for adults you know it's like we should actually be learning from them yeah I mean I couldn't have said it better there it is so <laughs> I agree oh well this has been so great to talk to you I really appreciate you yeah. taking the time fun on my side too Oh, for sure. For sure. You know, Shannon, the one thing I would say is, you know, you as a parent, you know, you can only give so much guidance. What parents want is somebody taking care of the damn kid right now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So the, I, I think you can make a lot of money and do a lot of good online, but at the end of the day, it's like parents need space from their children. Like they, you know what I'm saying? So yes. that's why I think it's, that's why I think it's hard to make the online stuff work in this period with COVID. Cause right. it's like, we don't need more online training. We need take care of my damn kids. It's you true. Know? Yeah, you're totally right. And it's like, who has time to do an online course when they're yeah. with their kids at home? Yeah, you're absolutely so, right. 
Um, but yeah, I don't think it's impossible. I think it's, you know, you clearly people are in need and people have money to pay for their needs. But I'm just saying that the real pain right now is their schools aren't open and, and they're with, it's just, it's a, it's a mess as you know, I mean, it's just horrible. So. And okay. My final question, I promise. Like yeah, yeah, this is for- my biggest worry right now about the kids is that for example, all the little ones, they're missing all these sensitive periods. Yeah. And those don't come back. So after a year of not being in their Montessori environment, what do you predict is going to happen to them? I mean, I think this is, I'm, I'm hugely about parents having their children in Montessori early, right? Like I think we all know how important the early ages of life are and so forth. But I just think love and respect for a child and doing stuff, there's so much to do in your house. So the problem is parents don't know how to do it. Right. So that's the real challenge. And, and they don't, as you said, it's so overwhelming right now to sit down and take a course on how to do it. While it's, it's right. just, that's the bad state. But if parents could just say, you know what, to hell with school, it's not going to happen for a while. Even Montessori is not going to happen. Don't put your child in front of a computer to talk with any teacher for three, four hours a day when they're under eight or something. like it's just seven it's, it's too hard and I know even as a, as a for me if I was a school leader right now I would definitely do online stuff but I wouldn't pretend that we're going to redo the classroom online like it just there's so much fun and excitement and building and creation you can do at home in this adaptive interim period yeah. so if parents if the guilt and all that could just chill for a moment and just have respect and love and just have your child do the things you're doing, clean, cook, um, plant some stuff in the back, build a freaking fort. They might even grow more during this time. So I'm, I'm more optimistic about it, but I, I'm also realistic that a lot of parents don't have this knowledge and it's very hard to get that sense of peace. I mean, that's so hard, but if you can get a little bit of it, a lot, you know, a little can go a long way is what I would say. Yeah. Well, I love what you just said, like have your child do everything that you're doing. I mean, obviously not your job, but like you're, <laughs> Maybe. you're cooking, <laughs> yeah, depending on your job, but like you're cooking, you're cleaning, you're walking to the mailbox to get the mail, like just talking to them and like just doing mm-hmm. practical life. Right. You think like if you're just doing practical life with them between, you know, walking and six years old, like you're doing a great job. Yeah. And you guys have, I don't know if you have an act in fair in El Salvador. Do you have one of those or have you created, you know, like, yeah, the business fair. Yeah. We just did Uh, it and we did it online. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. So I mean, that's the, like those kids, especially the ones that you got in elementary and I mean, they're creating stuff that's cool that we're creating, you know, and it's just, it's awesome. So it is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been great talking to you. And I hope that we, um, I don't know, meet one day in the United States or somewhere. (laughs) Yeah, my pleasure. And, you know, once all this COVID craziness is done, you know, hopefully we can like really meet, maybe give a hug in person, you know? Yeah, yeah, that would be great. So I wish you all the best. Get through COVID safely and um, say hola to your wife. (laughs) Yeah, back to you. Hola to your husband. (laughs) Thank you. All right. Take care, friend. Good. All right, Shannon. Adios. Thanks for listening to the New Schools Podcast. Tell a friend. Previous episodes and show notes, including any books or websites our guests recommend, can be found at thenewschools.com. If you're a parent who is looking for a new school for your family, send us a message. We would love to help. We can answer questions, share the resources we have, and help you get in touch with people in your area who are on the same path, determined to provide their kids with the best education. It's wildly important work. Thank you for doing it. And we'll see you next time.